Hello again, this is Jim Moore and you are watching Words of Encouragement. Pray that you're having a great day. I uh, went off and then had to come back on again. Seems like there's always something going on with, uh, with the internet. So glad to have you here this morning. This is day number 410. We are on the fourth day of January 2022. Pretty amazing. I remember as a young man serving the Lord, following the Lord. I didn't really think I'd ever see this day uh, to live this long, but yeah, here we are. Yeah, a little bit gloomy outside looking. Again, a little dark. Um, not so much dark, but overcast. And uh, But it's going to be a good day. We're going to love Jesus today, right? Amen. Going to stay closely connected to him today right? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, life has a way of threatening to try to take over all of your thoughts and your time. Good morning, Cheryl. Nice to have you. And uh, yeah, you know, if you're not careful, it can do that. I mean, and sometimes, you know, difficult things happen in, in such a overwhelming way. Good morning that you, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to keep your focus on the Lord. That's why God created the Avenue of Prayer. So I had a, just a great time with the Lord this morning. I hope that you take some time to do that. Um, good morning, Randy. Good morning, Jennifer. Good to see you. You know, often we, we are busy telling ourselves that we can't do certain things. I don't have time, you know, my schedule, blah, blah, blah. We are so good at giving ourselves excuses. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. How you doing? Nice to see you. And Debbie, God bless you. Nice to have you. And uh, good morning, Randy. Yeah, you know, um, any of you that it's ever been in a relationship um, with another human being, which would be all of you, understand that relationships take uh, time. In an effort. And time is the one thing that we are always struggling with uh, to divide appropriately. We've only been given so many hours in the day. And um, there's a saying that says that uh, life abhors a vacuum. And um, whatever you don't choose to fill your time with will be filled by other entities, okay? In other words, your time is going to get filled with something and you have a choice. It is the greatest commodity that God has given you. The greatest commodity in life is the time that you have. And every moment is a seed that you are sowing into either this life or eternity. And uh, so anyway, you know, take, make up your mind. 2022, we're still at the beginning of this. We're still at the beginning of this year. You still have time to decide the course corrections that you are willing to make. Even if you fail sometimes, remember the, uh, the journey of a thousand miles, right? You've got to start. You know, can't just think about it. You actually have to start. And, uh, and you're going to fail. I know most 99% of people never tell you that. But here's the truth, you will fail at times. I'm not saying altogether. But uh, if you make a decision, I'm going to pray every, I'm going to get on my knees every day. And I'm going to come before the, the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. I'm going to come before the King of kings every day and um, bow my knee to the Lord. You know what? You're not going to do it every day. You're not. You know, maybe you'll be that 1%, that one hundredth of you know what I'm saying? I'm saying that the enemy tries to keep us from making decisions, saying, oh, I've tried that before and I failed. I love this phrase. You've heard me say it many times. I'm going to say it again. 50% of any commitment is better than 100% of no commitment. Okay? If you make no commitment, you're going to be 100% successful at accomplishing that. All right? Don't let your fear of not doing it completely perfect stop you from making that commitment. You'd be better to make a commitment to pray every day and seek the Lord, even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, I think you can do more than that, but let's start with what, what we know we can do. We know we can do that. I mean, anybody that says they can't take 15 minutes out of a 24-hour day to pray is lying to themselves, okay? We know we can do that. 
even if you only do that half the time that you commit to doing it, that you will be ahead by making that plan and by executing that plan, you know, even with, with the shortcomings, then you would be had you just go, ah, I can't do it, so I'm not even going to try. You get what I'm saying? You know, 50%, 60%, 70% of any commitment is better than 100% of no commitment. So I just want to encourage you today as we start out. Humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God. Prayer, the study of his word, are acts of humility. Prayer is a weak instrumentality in the natural, but it is mighty through God. So this morning I went to prayer, and um, and at some particular point I got on my knees, and I, I like getting on my knees. I, I have a commitment, uh, kind of. And again, don't let somebody convince you that discipline is the same thing as religion. Honey, it's not, okay? One person's discipline is another person's religious activity. People do the same things for different reasons, and that's really the point. Religion, or the idea of being religious, as it were, apart from God, is really a heart issue. One person takes communion with, with an intense desire to have communion with the Lord and passion. Good morning, Kev. God bless you. Need to talk to you today, okay? And um, other people take communion with a sense, with an insincere heart. They're just going through the motions, okay? It's the same way as, as some people say their their rote prayer every time. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. Other people are really doing that. So it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. So the real issue of religion, in my opinion, is that is not so much what you're doing. It's why you're doing it. So come before the Lord. I like to kneel down. It's not the only way I pray, but it is one of the ways. It, the One of the reasons that kneeling, I'm kind of getting ahead of my, myself here, but one of the reasons that kneeling before the Lord is, is a predominant, if not the predominant, posture prayer in the Bible, and, and it is very predominant, is because it emphasizes and demonstrates a heart of humility. When someone kneels down before another individual, that's showing submission, it's showing humility, and, um, and again, you can do that and it means nothing. Or you can do it and it means everything to you because you are kneeling before as a servant, before your master, saying, I am here for you today. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. I love you. I want to serve you. And that doesn't take away from the loving aspect. It doesn't take away from the friendship aspect. We need to understand that we build upon foundations. Okay, In the Bible, the, the New Jerusalem has... Uh, 12 foundations, okay? So I don't know how many we have, but one of our foundations is the fear of the Lord. One of them is humility. One of them is uh, being a servant. And then we move on. We, we Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. Okay, It doesn't mean they cease to be one, but they have a new title that he gives them. It doesn't mean they're not servants anymore. He just said, I'm not going to call you that anymore because you've come up a level. Now I'm going to call you friends, Okay. What does that mean? That presupposes that before they became a friend, or before he called them friend, he did call them servants. I, he didn't say, I'm, I'd never call you that because that's beneath your status. No, he's saying, I'm no longer, you've grown, you've advanced. So, we build upon the foundation. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I'm a wreck. Sometimes I come on this program, I go, God, really, can't I just say no today? <laughs> Because I just bawled my face off this morning. And you know what? That's okay. It's really okay. You know, sometimes I, I, uh, I just wonder, Lord, are, do you want us just to be a spectacle to the earth? And I think he says, yeah. Amen. All right. So I love you guys today. Um, Philip, or excuse me, Peggy, God bless you. Aaron, again, if I miss your name, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually further away from my, my camera here than I normally am because of the room and the condition that I'm in. I won't uh, elaborate on that. So we're going to look at something uh, today. You know, my primary gifting before the Lord, I really believe, is revelation from the Word of God. I was reminded by the Lord this morning that when I was uh, a young man, Dale, God bless you. I hope you're doing well, friend. Uh, I used to sit around with uh, young people, we got saved, and uh, we were all a bunch of rowdies. You know, we were we were uh, drug addicts. You know, we we just were not. You know, long haired freaky people need not apply. 
that's a song. Uh, but we were not uh, what you'd call your upstanding citizens, you know. And, but the Lord was gracious to us. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep kicking my stand here. Uh, the Lord was gracious to us. And he, he reached down and saved. And I was one of the first that got saved in the little group that I ran with. And then more came in. But one thing happened. You know, God is, I believe, always trying to show you what your gift mix is. And if you just kind of pay attention to it. And uh, one thing that I picked up on right away was when we would do a Bible study. Hi, Dana. God bless you. Uh, good morning. When we did a Bible study in the morning. Or in the morning, sorry. Uh, I would, I would have, the Word would open up to me. I had no uh, great intelligence in the Word of God. I hadn't studied the Word of God. But we would sit around, and I always wound up kind of leading the Bible study, not, not by intention, but kind of by default, because there was a tremendous amount of revelation that I would get as I read it. And so sometimes we have large portions of the scripture that we don't really feel very connected to. And I'm of the persuasion that every word that God has given us, all scripture, that means every word is profitable. Okay. Now, again, sometimes we just sort of roll over these verses. I, I, I my primary desire here in encouraging you today and every day is through the revelation of the written word of God. Now, it's, I know that the written word is not the only word, okay? You know my stand on that. I believe in the prophetic word. I believe in the revelatory word. I believe in all kinds. I believe God talks to you in ways that probably we don't even, aren't even very attuned to. I actually think God talks to you through, the, well, the heavens, you know, the, the stars, the universe, the uh, movies, you know, people, uh, books. I, I mean, I've had God talk to me in crazy ways. So, but the Word of God is at the top of the food chain. It really is, okay? we have, This is what the Bible says is a more sure word of prophecy. Uh, the prophetic things that pointed to Jesus hundreds of years before they happened and so on. So my intention is to encourage you primarily from the words of the Lord and, of course, from testimonies and so on. So this study today is going to be out of 1 Peter chapter 5. And uh, it's called the dress code. I titled it the dress code because that's what came to me this morning. Okay, The Bible and heaven has a dress code. And uh, it actually, this is not the only piece of the dress code, but it's the one I'm highlighting today. <clears throat> so uh, any of you have ever had the privilege of going to a, a job or a perhaps a school where they had a dress code? I've worked at places where uh, the dress code was the same for everyone within uh, a little bit of you know, reason. So you might be surprised to know that the kingdom of heaven has a dress code, but it is, of course, like all things uh, in heaven, it is the upside down kingdom, and it is different than what you might think. And, that, and again, there are many aspects to it, just like if you go to work, you have a certain, uh, perhaps a certain apron that you have to wear, or a certain hard hat, or a certain shirt, or a certain pair of pants, or dress, or whatever, Okay, there are components to it, and we are told to put on Christ, okay, to be clothed with humility, and that's where I'm going to go today. So there are a number of things, but we're going to emphasize humility. Now, Satan broke the dress code, okay? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take my glasses off, so I'm not reflecting here. The enemy broke the dress code in heaven. So... I believe that humility is one of the underemphasized components of the kingdom. Now, I want to be honest about this. One of the reasons that I feel like I came to this understanding is because of a book that came across my path years and years ago that I received a tremendous amount. I've done my best to tell other people about it. And uh, I mean, besides the Bible, of course, the Bible is in a in a classification all its own, but it is the book called The Final Quest and written by a man named Rick Joyner who had a series of experiences where he saw, he went to heaven and saw certain things, and I, I'm not going to go into all of it, but one of the primary uh, delineations of that book was the idea of humility, and um, you know, there are just some things that when you read, 
you ever read the Bible and you've read certain passages of Scripture and they just they just kind of don't really do much for you? You just sort of skip over them. And then you go back another time and read them and boom, they blow up in your face. And it's like people say, well, it's like the words leapt off the page. They leap off the pages, you know, all these different ways we say it. It comes alive. What I didn't see before I see. Now that is the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? We know that that's what we call divine revelation. That's the unveiling. That's the Lord saying, hey, that thing that maybe didn't move you that much, now all of a sudden it moves you. Or you maybe you read it a hundred times, and on the hundred and first time, you've gotten all kinds of revelation out of it, and you read it one more time, okay, and, and you see something you never saw before. That is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So I think humility is one of those really understated principles of the Bible. Now, one of the difficult things about it, and we'll, I'll just start out right now by saying this, is that humility is actually very hard to describe. <laughs> and it's even harder to say you have it, because it's almost like if you say you have it, then that's kind of evidence you don't have it. I, I, yeah, I don't know how to... I am not here to define humility, because I'm not sure I could. It's, uh, it's kind of like defining love, you know, you could, you, it's hard, it's difficult. Pride, being the polar opposite of humility, is the thing that caused Satan to fall. All right, the enemy fell because of pride. He was exalted, okay, he had his tabrets, his musical instruments in him, his name was Lucifer, he was in charge of a third of the angels, uh, it says his, he had, was perfect in beauty, he walked among the fiery stones, and so on and so on. He had a highly exalted position until pride entered into his heart and it brought him down. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pride before humility so that we have a little bit of a contrast here to compare. So pride is, is a primary issue that is bad, 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 okay? And uh, pride is something that I think every human being, again, my opinion, every human being deals with this. We have the capacity within us in our fallen nature and our divine nature, we do have both, to either walk in humility or to walk in pride. So the idea that we have one or the other, well, I'm not a prideful person. <laughs> Probably you have some, you, I'm sure you do have some. You know, uh, well, I'm, I'm a very humble person. Well, <laughs> I'm sure you do have some humility. You get what I'm saying? So it's something that is a contest that's in us all, that we actually have the ability to decide which direction we're going to point ourselves in. Now, that doesn't mean you ever maybe fully get, you know, the humility of the Lord. And, and again, Jesus is a humble king. We serve a humble king. He is the epitome of what humility is. So as in all things, if you want to see something that is good and right, that the scripture you know, enjoins us to follow, look to the man who has it all. Look to the God who invented the idea. Okay, Jesus came as a king. Okay, He came as a king, a meek and lowly savior, as the song says, riding on a donkey. When he entered into Jerusalem the first time and they shouted, Hosanna, he was coming in as a king. He was coming, but, but not, you know, his, his kingdom, okay, you get what I'm saying. There was some advancing. He was going to go to the cross, resurrect, and then it's our turn to walk it out and so on. So this wasn't the completion. He's going to come into Jerusalem a second time, mark it down. It is an actual happening. And he will come in as a glorified king with a you know, bringing the fullness of the kingdom with him, and he will sit on a throne as a king in Jerusalem. So, can't go down that path too much here, but <clears throat> he came in the first time hu humbly, humility. It doesn't get much more humble sitting on a, a young donkey, a foal, okay, that's like a young, it's like a fawn of a deer, it's a foal of a donkey, a full-grown donkey, so it's youthful and so on. That's humility. And they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. All right, so Jesus is the one who lived out it to perfection what humility looks like. This doesn't mean he never got angry. doesn't mean he never corrected. It certainly didn't mean he kowtowed to others who uh, demanded that he speak 
you know, falsehood, you know, and he, but he did it. He walked it out perfectly. So he is the perfect example of humility. Satan, on the other hand, is the ultimate example of pride. He, and what pride leads to, which is, are you ready for this? I'm going to be God. I don't believe in God. Or I do believe in God, but I hate God. I don't like God. I think God is mean, blah, blah, blah. All this is, the Luciferian doctrine, really, is not so much the existence of God, and let's rebel against this all-powerful God. Now, that's hardcore Satanism, but most people that hold a Luciferian doctrine say, basically, that there is no God. You are God. You are God. Can I just say this? It's the same thing. Either way, you're denying the God that created you, and so on and so on. So I'm not saying any of you do that. All right. So pride was found in the enemy's heart, and he was lifted up in pride, and it led to his ultimate rebellion against the Lord, and his being cast out, and his being condemned to a Christless, godless, eternal lake of fire. That's the end. That's, you see, these things have an end. Okay, humility and embracing the Father, embracing the goodness of God, embracing the truth of God, and so on, has a lead. It leads us to eternal life. It leads us to a place of, of glory. It leads us to living forever with the Lord of heaven and earth. Okay, so that's, you get a little bit of understanding. The scripture talks about that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Okay? In other words, it leads to something where you don't want to go. And the other thing, of the three classifications of error that mankind can walk in, it says the lust of the eyes, right here, the lust of the flesh, and lust simply means strong desire. So don't necessarily confuse the word lust with sexual desire, even though primarily that's what it means to most people today. When you say the word lust, they almost automatically think of sexual uh, desire, wrong sexual desire, okay? But lust simply means, in the purest form of the word, it would certainly include that, but it means a strong, almost overpowering desire. So the lust of the eyes, your, your eyes desire and want something. The lust of the flesh, your flesh desires and wants something, which could be a number of things. And then the third component of error or missing the mark, what we call sin, is the pride of life. Now, a lot of people have uh, tried to interpret what the pride of life means. I'll give you one possible interpretation of that, and that is that your life is your own. That you get to do whatever you want to do, and at the end, that's all there is. That, to me, is the pride of you rejecting, you and I, I'm not saying you who are listening to me, you and I rejecting the giver of life. That I did not create my life. I am not sustaining my own life. I mean, I am, I have a responsibility, you understand that, but God is the author. Jesus says, I'm the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All life springs from the life giver. So the pride of life says that's not true. The pride of life says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's the pride of life. So that thing is always trying to find its way in. Okay, this is one of the primary things. Actually, if you look at all of those components, when the serpent tempted our forefathers, our parents, I was kind of stunned the idea the other day that all humanity came from two people. That's just a stunning thought. Anyway, okay, I want a bunny trail. The lust of the eyes. They looked upon and they saw that the fruit was good for eating. Okay, the desire of the flesh. They desired to be like God. They wanted to be like God. That's what the uh, serpent was tempting them. Okay, and the pride of life. What was the pride that entered into that? The pride of refusing to believe in what God said, that he was good, that all this that he made for them, there was actually something better he was withholding from them. All of those things were points of desire that the enemy was using to tempt them with. Okay? So, okay, let's uh, get off of pride and let's talk about humility. So I want to, uh, I actually have a lot of verses on here today, which is a, I don't know if it's a problem I have, but it kind of is sometimes because I, I read one verse and I probably ought to stick with one or two verses, but I wind up wanting to do the whole chapter. Okay, so I, we'll see how this goes. So number one, 
uh, again, I put a definition from Wikipedia about what is a dress code? What is a dress code? A dress code is a set of rules, often written, which actually we have a written dress code, with regards to what clothing groups of people must wear. Typically, this has to do, in most cases, with either employment or education in the school systems. Okay, But we are told to be clothed, clothed, put on like you would clothing, humility. Now, if you do get a chance to read that book, The Final Quest, which I would, it's one of the few books that I would wish that everybody would read. Uh, it talks a lot about the way heaven views those who are clothed with humility. And the more anointed you become, there, most of you have a desire to be used in a greater capacity by the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. There must be a, a humility because Power corrupts, uh, the limelight, you know, it's, it's a heady wine, as one person said, when God begins to use you to heal the sick or speak words that bring life to people or give you a platform where you have a degree of popularity. Uh, take this as a serious warning, okay, because that's exactly what it is. You can be blinded by the glory of the Lord that's coming through your human being, okay? And again, uh, I think the way it's laid out and the way God laid it out before uh, Rick in that book was stunning. And what it, whenever he wore the cloak, I'm not going to try to go into it deeper, but whenever he wore this cloak of humility, he, he was able to see clearly because he wasn't blinded by his own greatness. Okay? All right, that's all I'll say about that. So let's read the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, I'm going to read some of it until I get and then comment a little bit on it. So hang out with me here for a minute. The elders, now this is Peter talking, right? And he, Peter sees himself as an elder, even though he's an apostle, he kind of diminishes his own position in a way and says, you know, I'm just, I'm just an elder. I am an elder, okay? But it isn't say, uh, I, Peter, an apostle among you. And that would not have been wrong for him to say that. But again, I think he knows he's gonna talk about humility and so he's posturing himself in that way. And it's not phony. Okay, he's not just trying to be humble, as it were. Okay, the elders who are among you, that's who he's addressing, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So he's about ready to exhort them. He said, hey, I'm coming as one of you. You're an elder, I'm an elder. I'm not saying I'm so great and better than all. I'm just saying, hey, I've... I've seen the Lord, I've witnessed his sufferings, and I've witnessed him in his glory to some degree. Okay, Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he saw the Lord ascend, you know, and so on and so on. He's saying, on this basis, I'm trying, I want to appeal to you. And the Bible does tell us specifically, so I'm talking to leaders, if there happens to be any who will watch the program today. The scripture tells us that we are not to lord over the flock, we're not to to act as though somehow we're superior to other people. We're not called to be, he that would be the greatest among you must become the least. And he that would, would be chief among you has to be a servant. So the highest form of leadership in the kingdom is service. And so this takes humility too. It takes, it doesn't mean you're walked over by people. It doesn't mean you allow evil to prosper in the midst. I mean, there's correction, instruct, all kinds of things that happen. But your mindset and your heart is that I am not here to build something that will reflect well upon me. I am here to serve the people that have a like mind in whatever assignment God has currently given. When we did the House of Prayer, we had a tremendous amount of um, uh, mechanics involved in what we were doing. I mean, to have 20, not 24, but 12 uh, groups of people musicians, prayers, intercessors coming up uh, on the stage once every two hours, another group coming up and doing that every single day of the year, including Christmas for years and years. That is a tremendous mechanical. When I say mechanics, don't see that as a bad thing. I'm just saying there are certain things that had to happen for that to happen. And so it was really easy to get focused on that. And I know, I'm sure there were times that we did not do that well, that we were so intent. I was so intent I'm making sure the oil of night and day worship and intimacy and prayer and intercession went on in our city 
that sometimes we were really scrambling and just out there searching, please, will you come and help us do this thing? So it's easy to forget that in the context of that, what you're doing, whatever your assignment is, you're meant to serve. You're there to serve. Okay, so sometimes, again, you're not always going to do it successfully, but it's important that we keep coming back to that. At least what we do becomes more important than the people we do it for. Now, the flip side to that, I'm just going to say real quick, too, is that the body of Christ, the church, over many, many generations, especially in the West, in our entertainment-driven society, thinks everything ought to be about them, okay? That's a general statement. Not everybody feels that way. But we definitely have gotten into entertainment mode many times. We come in, we sit down, we fold our arms, and we just kind of watch and see, kind of like we would if we were going to the movies. We kind of have lost the concept that we are there to minister first to the Lord and then to one another. It's like that kind of got left off of the program, you know, very, very gradually. And Linda and I have been to churches in different states. I won't mention it even the states, but places where where it is degenerated to the place where people literally just sit there and watch. Uh, they don't they don't even sing anymore. I, you know, and I've watched this progress downward. What am I saying? I'm saying we have to maintain this understanding that even though we are there to serve, we are first there to serve the Lord, minister to the Lord, the idea of ministering to God in worship and so on. Okay, so that's the flip side. I'm trying to give you both sides of that. There's this place where... It can get really mechanical, but then there's a place where it can be all me-centric. Everything's about me, and so on and so on. All right. Okay, so here's where he starts commanding them. He's giving them, he's exhorting them, actually, was the word Peter used. Shepherd, he said, to the leaders, to the elders. Shepherd the flock of God. Now, you may think this doesn't apply much to me because I'm not a shepherd. Actually, can I give you a piece of advice? You are a shepherd. Many of you, most of you maybe, are parents. You, are sh- you have a flock, and you are responsible to shepherd that flock. You will definitely answer to the Lord for your leadership over your home. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the qualifications to be a leader over a larger group of people was that you led your family well. It says if you cannot shepherd your family well, how are you going to, you know, that's if your assignment is extended to a larger group of people. So all of us in one degree or another are shepherding other people. Now, yours may be on the lowest end of that, okay? <clears throat> but I guess what I'm saying is don't give yourself an excuse. Don't give yourself an out. Say, well, nobody's really watching me. Nobody really cares. I'm just a, a voice in the wind, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not true. There, there's somebody out there watching you. There's somebody out there who is looking to you and depending upon you and needs your help, your prayer, your instruction, your love, your hands-on. Okay, so we all have some little flock that we're shepherding. So when he says shepherd the flock, even though he's primarily speaking to the elders in the of the church of Jesus that he was overseeing, he was shepherding, uh, it really applies in one way or another to all of us. So he said, shepherd the flock which is among you, serving, okay, there's that word again, as overseers, okay, I'm actually in this capacity right now at the House of Prayer. I am more in the coach capacity now. I'm not running the farm. But uh, Richard Frank, good man, is running the farm. And uh, and I kind of give a much more general oversight, sit on the board. I'm, I'm more in the uh, position of a coach. But my heart is still deeply connected to the prayer movement. It's still deeply connected to what God is doing in that arena because that's the assignment He's placed upon me, okay? So I just threw that in there. So serving as overseers, not by compulsion, not because you have to, okay? Now, these are words that are good for leadership. One of the temptations of leadership is, again, it always it comes down to motive. Everything springs out of motive. So it's appropriate to check our motive often, often. And again, don't just check out and say, this doesn't apply to me because blah, blah, blah. Okay, all of us should check our motive. Am I serving people as I serve the Lord? Am I serving them as I would serve him? And as much as you've done it to the most important of these, no, the least of these, you've done it unto me. So am I serving him by serving them? Am I loving them while I'm serving them? In other words, I'm not doing it by compulsion or God forbid because of money. I think one of the worst things that happens uh, to uh, ministers and people in charge of things is 
the need to have their finances, that because every ministry to one degree or another depends on finances, there is such a pressure there, and mostly unperceived, to do things to get enough people and get enough giving to continue doing what you feel like your assignment is. Now, there's a way to do that, a way to gather resources and so on in, in the right motive, in the right heart, and the right methods, okay? But it has to be something that you actually think about, okay? At least you fall into that trap of just kind of the end justifies the means, and you're sort of willing to do whatever you has to, well, I have to do this because, because, you know, if I, these people aren't coming, then what's the point, and blah, blah, blah. So compulsion means the opposite of serving out of a heart of love. I am serving these people because I love them. Yes, I have a job to do. Yes, I want to be excellent. Yes, it takes a certain amount of resource and energy from various people, other people, and so on. But I want to keep bringing myself back to you. Am I loving? Am I in love with Jesus? Am I loving these people as I would love him? Am I doing what I do with humility? Not because I think I'm the man. I heard a phrase years ago really, really impressed me. He says, instead of you thinking that it's these people's honor to serve you as a leader, you ought to be thinking that it's your honor to serve them. And that really struck me in my youth. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's really the truth, isn't it? You know, because it's really easy to get haughty, especially if God uses you. Okay, especially if you're the person that God is anointing. And is, I mean, pride can so easily enter in. So you have to check yourself. You have to ask the Lord, Lord, keep me in humility. And really, the Bible says, humble yourself. <laughs> okay, it, it says the Lord knows how to humble those that are proud. And you ought to be grateful that he does. Because sometimes, you know, pride really depends on its ability to stay hidden. If a person sees their own pride... They have a tendency to go yuck, especially a believer. Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe not so much if you're not. But so pride depends on its ability to stay hidden. So if you have hidden pride, which probably most of us to some small or great degree have, it is the job and the great kindness and faithfulness of the Lord to manifest that, to say, hey, dude, do that. You have some pride here, okay? He knows, the Bible says, how to humble those that are proud. I didn't put that scripture in there, but you can look it up. You can Google it. Look at the scripture about God and his way he deals with pride and humility. All right. He said, serving not by compulsion, because you have to, but willingly, not for dishonest gain. There's the money part but eagerly. And notice he said dishonest gain, because there is an honest gain, or that he would just say gain. Don't serve for gain. Okay? Have you thought about that? Okay? It's like, you know, uh, don't accept any phony $3 bills. Well, you don't need to say the word phony, because they're all phony. Okay? There's no such thing as a real $3 bill. <laughs> there has to be a real before there's a counterfeit. And that's why I said don't do what you do for dishonest gain, because there should be gain that comes along with any occupation. The workman is worthy of what? Of his hire. Okay, God is not so like, I don't know, like slave driver says, you're going to work and you're never going to get anything out of it until you get to heaven. That's just not, he says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And then he goes on to say, is God, does God care for oxen? In other words, is he, do you think he's really primarily talking about animals? Okay. So, all right, you get the point. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, Okay, when's the last time you had an eager heart to do something for the Lord? <laughs> the enemy's job is to make anything that looks like ministry be a disappointment to you. Trust me. Okay, it's, it's no big badge of honor to, to blame the ministry and hate the ministry. And I, I them never, no, 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 no. The Bible, the, the apostles, the, the scripture, God declares that it's a glorious honor to be called to that. It's only when we mess it up that it becomes bad. Or only we do it because we feel like it's the only way to please God. Or we're going to get earthly gain. Or this or that. There's a lot. It's our improper motives that cause the, dip, the, the you know, despondency that happens sometimes. In the, the ministry is a good thing. Don't you believe otherwise? It is a good thing. Okay? And God wouldn't punish people. <laughs> 
And sometimes it's hard because, you know, you got a flock, right? You're a shepherd, okay? Whatever that means, whatever that title means to you, you got a, you got a flock. And what happens? You're among a bunch of sheep, okay? Which we are all sheep, okay? And you, they're stinky sheep, okay? They make a mess everywhere they go. And they, they sometimes are really, I mean, sheep are kind of funny animals out there. They could be little baby lamb. They're just so cute. And, and if you show them a lot of love, they show love back to you. But then they're out there biting each other. And they, you know, you anoint my head with oil. Why? Because they get insects and germs. And, and so, so anytime you deal with people, there's going to be a lot of crud that goes along with it. But listen. You know, that's not, that's not because the ministry is some evil thing. It's because, again, it always comes back to the same issue. It's us, okay? It's people. We're the ones. All right, anyway, so he said, um, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those who have been entrusted to you, but by being examples to the ch uh, flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, okay? The Lord is my shepherd, right? When the chief shepherd, we are under shepherds. We see him as the pastor, okay? If you're a pastor, you, whatever leadership role you're in, maybe you do a Bible study. He is the chief Bible study leader. Maybe you are a singer. He is the chief worshiper. You need to see him as shepherd is a really general term, one who shepherds or takes care of the sheep. However, you're taking care of them, Whatever your lot in life is, whether it's your family, if you're a parent and you're shepherding, uh, you know, clause is that of a parent, he is the chief parent. Okay, we need to see ourselves as under shepherds to the chief shepherd, under singers, under laborers, under librarians. It doesn't matter. You need to see the Lord. Now, if your assignment and occupation is something wicked, then it's not an assignment from God, and you need to repent and run away from that at 100 miles an hour. Okay, but we're talking about things that are good and right. All right. The chief shepherd appears. You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And then he goes on to say, likewise, younger people, submit yourself to the elders. All of you be submissive. Okay. Here's where it says, be clothed, put on, okay, with humility. Let me read it. I got to read it. Likewise, younger people submit. Oh, there's a word we hate. When you read something like this and something rises up in you and you don't like it, you know what you need to do? Instead of just being in agreement with that, you need to repent. You do. You need to Get on your knees and say, Lord, I don't do this, and I don't like this, because typically it comes back to some bad experience we had in our life. And we told ourselves, I'll never fall for that again. I'll never do that again. I'll never allow myself to be in a position where I get hurt again. Normally, that's what it comes down to. But the Bible still says, I, I use this example, and I want to be careful, because a lot of people have had really bad parents in their life. I've had, I had good parents in my life, even though they weren't perfect. I loved my mom and my dad, and they were good parents. I was very fortunate in that regard. Okay, but a lot of people were not so fortunate. But can I say this? And I want to say this with humility and with tenderness for those of you who've had a bad experience with parenthood. Even though you may have had the worst possible experience, God has not changed his mind about the family unit. Okay, maybe you had a bad pastor. God has not changed his mind about having pastors and having a church. Maybe you had a terrible experience at the worst church in the world. He has not changed his mind about the church. Do you get what I'm saying? And this is not to minimize. I know the pain that comes with people doing wrong things in the context. And when they do it in the context of God, it's a hundred times worse. You know, we kind of expect wicked, sinful, godless people to do wicked, sinful, godful things. But when they're in the body of Christ and they still do those things, it makes it so much harder. But, okay, and we need counseling, we need forgiveness, we need to work through it, we need to bring healing. Yes, 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 a hundred times yes, all of that. But here's the flip side to that. You cannot make an agreement with your pain and say, well, somehow that means I get a hall pass, I get to come out of that, this doesn't apply to me, okay? God hasn't changed his mind about parenthood. He hasn't changed his mind about the church. Now, why do I say that? Because this is one of those issues that he's, this word submitted. 
if you've ever been submissive to someone, and no doubt many of you listening have, and that person has walked out their leadership over you in an inappropriate way, it's very, very easy for you to have a seed in your heart that says, I will not ever be in a submissive posture to anyone again. So this part of the Bible, you rip out. And you say, that doesn't apply to me. And even though he's addressing younger people in this particular, he winds up saying to everyone, loving people, serving people is a vulnerable place. This is one of the issues of humility. Think about Jesus, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Do you not think that that was incredibly painful for him? I don't believe there's anybody on the planet that went through more disappointment and pain and betrayal than Jesus did. Okay, so why did he continue to serve? Because he knew that if he kept doing what he was supposed to do, that that would have the greatest level of impact. It's hard to forgive people. It's hard sometimes. All right, let's read it. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to the older. Okay, and again, this is not saying if you have a toxic relationship that you should stay in it. That's not what this is saying at all. Okay, if you've got a relationship at, the, at your work or at your, your you know, church or whatever, you name it, and it's really toxic and they are abusive and all that, I think in most cases the Lord says, hey, get away from that. That's hurting you. It's hurting other people. We're not supposed to, what is the scripture? There's a one that says light has no fellowship with darkness. There, there are parameters for this. I know I've got time to investigate every one of them, but there are times that you do need to go, okay? <clears throat> and if you're in a toxic relationship, uh, you should consider very strongly getting away from that. But that doesn't mean then that you should never have a relationship. Or if you've had a bad shepherd, doesn't mean you shouldn't have a good one. So there is still a position where youth, okay, uh, I, I tell young people sometimes, I've been where you at, but you haven't been where I'm at. You will be one day, okay? I, have, I carry things because I have walked through them, and really young people can stand on the shoulders of the older people and go higher. But unless you have enough humility to, to search that out, okay, it's a, it's a horrible phenomenon that the older, I mean, we have older saints of God, and I'm becoming one, maybe this is so real to me now, but we have many older saints of God now who sit in isolation, and they're not the famous guy anymore, they're not the famous girl anymore, and so nobody seeks them out, nobody talks to them. I know, I know a number of shepherds like this that have a massive amount of revelation in their heart and it grieves them that it's like nobody wants them because and I'm just being real with you mostly because they're not on the platform they're not the big shiny thing anymore listen it takes humility to say that saint of God has something that I don't have and I want to pull from that now an interesting component to that and then I'll, I'll switch here is that typically after that same person dies, then everybody has this sudden surge of, oh, I want to honor them. Oh, I want to read their books. It is common knowledge that a person's writings, and please, I've written, so I'm not talking about myself here. I really am not. <clears throat> but a person's writings tend to become vastly, that's the word, vastly more popular after they die. Why is that? What is it about humanity that does that? I don't know. So this is what he's saying. Let, let there be a posture of willing, willingness to hear, willingness to receive. And it really comes down to the culture of honor that um, I think it was Danny Silk wrote about. Super, super good book if you've never read it. All right. All of you, he goes on and says, younger, be submitted to the older. All of you be submissive one to the other and be clothed with humility. Put on the clothing of humility. Now, how do you do that? I, I wish I could tell you. You know, I, I, you don't find many books out there about how to be humble, okay? I believe, primarily, it is acknowledging the humble king that we serve and asking for him to impart into you that humility and to keep you abreast 
of the the uh, the motives and the things that go on in your heart and when you are acting in pride and when you are have a motivation of self you know wanting to be out there and so on and so on read the 13th chapter of uh, first corinthians it talks a great deal about love being not something where it's seeking self but it's seeking the good of others all right let me read it one last time because I'm, I'm down to my last couple minutes here be clothed with humility for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you, exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. There's a lot right there. Probably should have started with those verses now. All right. I want to just end on one thought. God resists the proud. There's one, there's a negative and a positive here. God resists the proud. That's what you don't want. But he gives grace to the humble. Now, let me just unpack that for 30 seconds for you, and then I'll hopefully wrap it up here. The word resist, look it up in the Strong's, in your Greek uh, concordance or whatever. The word resist means to oppose. Now, I'm always telling you how the words kind of change over time. And what they start out isn't necessarily what they mean today. That's important to know, especially when you're looking at the words of God, because if a word in our English language or whatever language we speak changes, and it doesn't, no, it no longer means what it meant when the Lord spoke it. That's important. Okay, I'm not suggesting that you dissect every single word in the Greek and Hebrew. Okay, I don't know that that's necessary. But go for it if you want to do it. But this is one of those words. For us to resist means what? You're coming at me with a, a plate of food that I hate. I resist, okay? Resist means to kind of like stand off. It is not an aggressive response, and yet that's exactly what the word in the Greek means. To resist literally, are you ready for this? It literally means to fight against. Why does that matter? Because they're two different postures. If somebody's coming at me with a weapon, I can resist them, defend myself, stand off, run the other way, or I can actually aggressively oppose and fight against them. The word resist, look it up, it means to fight against. Let's read it in that context. Clothe yourself with humility. You want to do this because... For, that's a conjunction word, God, the ultimate power of the universe, he fights against the proud, but he gives grace or help. In this context, grace, grace literally means help. It means he's actually helping you. The same way he is fighting against you, now he's fighting for you. You get that? That's what this verse is saying. Pride and humility are paramount in the way we walk with God. Why? Because God's either going to be fighting against you. Why does he fight against pride? Remember how Satan fell? It is a foundational issue. He fell because of pride. It is a, it is a manifestation of that same spirit that caused the enemy to fall. Okay, uh, God, you know, what does it say that um, a haughty spirit goes before the, the destruction and pride before the fall? That's a phrase you all know, pride comes before the fall. Okay, so God says in his love, in his love, for you. He says, I'm going to fight against that pride. I will fight against that. And then the opposite is also true. He says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to assist you. We're over here. I, you don't want God fighting against you. That's the worst thing. Okay. He says over here, if you're walking in pride, I'm going to fight that. And I'm not fight you, but it's that thing that's, that's manifesting in your life. I'm going to oppose that. I'm going to resist. I'm going to fight against that. It's not saying you resisting the devil. It's saying, I'm going to resist. I'm going to fight. But again, even in the fighting, he's doing it for your good. Okay? And then, but the opposite. But God gives grace. Divine ability. Okay? He gives divine ability to who? Not just those who don't have pride, but those who walk in humility. Humble yourself, therefore, beneath the mighty hand of God. When you go and you surrender to the Lord and you get on your knees and you cry out to him, that is a demonstration of the humility that's in your heart that's trying to work its way out in your life. Okay, And he helps 
the humble. He gives grace. You know, we're living in a day right now that we need more, uh, you know, more help and more strength and maybe more grace than we've ever needed before. So there needs to be an acceleration of humility in our life. And again, nobody has it in spades, okay? Don't look to me or anybody and go, there's my example for humility. You know, not saying we don't set an example, but Jesus is the ultimate example of what it means to live a humble life, okay? Doesn't always mean being weak, okay? Doesn't always mean, you know, oh, you never stand up for anything and you never speak your peace. No, no, you look at the life of Jesus. Nobody did humility better than Jesus did, okay? All right, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. That's at least appropriate in some cases. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is this has been a kind of a different sort of a, a message today. I pray that it helps you. It's not meant to condemn you. There's no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus, but it is meant to challenge you to go, okay, you know, how can I, are there ways? I mean, the Holy Spirit's really good about showing us stuff when we ask. So, Lord, is there, are there ways I am manifesting pride? You know, I'm not talking about coming before God and beating your chest and screaming out and, you know, lashing yourself. I'm so proud. I'm so, no, no, no. We all probably have some struggle with pride. That's just the truth, okay? But we all have the capacity for humility, too. You probably are walking in some degree, you know, of both. Hopefully a large degree of humility and a very small degree of pride. But ask the Lord. Both things. Lord, am I walking in pride? And if he shows you, write it down, okay? Don't beat yourself up, but write it down. And then, because uh, actually asking him is an act of humility, right? And then say, now, Lord, how can I, how can I walk in greater humility? Okay, how can I be more like you in my humble king? How can I do that? And, you know, he'll show you. you know, maybe he'll show you through some other medium. I don't know. But asking is always the first step. Amen. God bless you. Father, thank you for your kids. Thanks for the privilege of being able to minister to them today. I pray let your words sink deep into their hearts, God. Help them to see themselves the way you see them, not the way they see themselves. Lord, give grace to them today to walk in your presence and in your spirit. Lord, in love and in mercy and in truth, even when they're abused, even when they're spoken evil against, you said to love those who do those things to us. So help them to walk in humility the way you did when you were on the earth. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you. Thank you. If this helped you today, I, uh, I would ask you to, to hit the like button and then leave a comment and then share it. Those three things will help get the word out. Um, I continue to be shadow banned. <laughs> so there are a lot of people that don't see this and God knows. He knows how to work through all that. I'm not too worried about it. So love you all. God bless you. Praying for you today. Send your prayer request if you have them. Be happy to pray over them. And as always, give yourself permission to have a great day. God bless.